Okay, so welcome to Stay at Home whiskey tasting number two. We've done this before with um, with some space side whiskies uh, at the very beginning of these online tastings. Um, I think it was our second one, and it proved quite popular. And the space side region is home to over fifty distilleries, so there's lots to play with. You know, you can do this. You can do this event a lot, a lot. You know, you can you can do a three, four, and five. Um, not quite stay at home anymore as it was when we done this back in, I think it was early April, where we were all under lockdown and we called them lockdown tastings. And I don't think they're, they're no longer lockdown tastings, they're more whiskey at home tastings now. Um, but still great fun because the reality is we're not going to be able to have any whiskey tastings in the, in the shop for the foreseeable future, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep this going. Um, I, I hope you. Um, enjoyed well you can't really enjoy packaging our packaging is we've updated it there and it's all fully compostable it's something that's really important to us we don't want to be sending lots of single use plastic out or bubble wrap and you know, the only good thing about bubble wrap is then you grab it and start popping it in your hands for a bit of fun and so it's great to we've got this packaging i hope it works it works for us i hope it works for you for able to recycle it or compost it really easily um, but we'll move on and uh, we'll, we'll go to our first whiskey and um, get it in the glass. I'm going to share with you, I'm going to show you a short video from this uh, whiskey distillery. Um, it's one of the one of the largest, or not the largest, but one of the larger ones in Speyside and it's Glen Livet. Um, very, very famous worldwide. Um, probably the, the one of the, the best selling single malts in Scotland. And I think it's the number one selling whiskey or single malt in France, and I think it's number two in America. It's huge, and I think one of the reasons it's so popular in France is its parent company is Pernod Ricard, so we have amazing distribution channels in um, in France. It also has distribution in Ireland. Uh, we don't get as many of the the, the, the range of Glenlivet over here. It's it wouldn't be as popular or as high up on the portfolio of Pernod Ricard over here. But then we're a small island with a small population as opposed to compared to France and America, we combined <laughs> nearly a population of 400 million. And that's where you're going to sell your whiskey, isn't it? Um, so this Glenlivet is the, found, uh, the Founders Reserve. No age statement. Um, so probably the most famous in the Glenlivet is the 12-year-old. But the Founders Reserve is sort of it's the one that's popping up everywhere at the moment. Uh, I don't actually have the bottle with me. It's the only one I'm missing tonight. And we moved all the bottling from my home to the pub, which means I don't look like a factory anymore. And I can I can go to bed tonight without the house smelling too much of whiskey every day. Um, but I, I will give you just a short video from Glen Levitt. It's from their website. Um, I, I actually really like this video. It's, it's only a minute long, but it really, it shows progression in the whiskey industry and something that we really need to you know listen to and, and say this is what you know this is whiskey is for everyone is sort of the message that i get out of this and whiskey can be drunk whatever way you want to drink it so i'll do a screen share and play the video for you they said it wasn't allowed that it was too risky. But then they also said we couldn't drink. I don't think I shared the screen. Sorry, give me a second. We'll start it again. My apologies. You think after uh, ten weeks of this, I'd be, I'd have this down to a T. <laughs> Just give me one second. Share the screen. There we go. Share. They said it wasn't allowed, that it was too risky. But then they also said we couldn't drink. But we drank. Whiskey's a man's drink for men, they cry. Let them cry. Drink 
think it meet, don't even chew it down. A single malt is sacred, they preach. Some traditions are meant to be broken. That's how we push things forward. So that's highlighting that essentially at the end of the Glen at 12. But uh, I think there's a, good, a, a really good, strong message there that whiskey's for everybody. And uh, you know, drink if you want to drink with ice, so you want no problem there, drink it how you feel comfortable drinking whiskey. And that's the beauty of it. I remember many years ago. Um, attending whiskey festivals and whiskey events like this in, in, in rooms and it was we'd get brand ambassadors stand up and go, oh, here's this whiskey. We call this the ladies' whiskey because it's perfect for the ladies' palate. And you're like, you're talking rubbish there. You know, I said, most women would have a better palate than men anyway, and that's that's fact. Um, so it's, I think it's a, there's a good message there for me that whiskey is for everybody and everybody should enjoy it and enjoy it the way they want to. So bring up your glass and give it a wee old sniff. Um, this is a 40% ABV, so a nice little starter. This would be uh, fully matured in ex bourbon barrels. Um, so it's, it's actually quite light and refreshing, I feel it's, you know, um, if you, this would be, a, if it's a whiskey for everybody, like we're saying, it's um, it's almost like an aperitif style whiskey. It's something you can drink early in the evening, you know, before dinner, something just, something light and refreshing. It, it's, I was going to say it'd be good on a summer's day, but today <laughs> we've, uh, we've got rain outside uh, for the first time in weeks, but, um, you know, all these warm warm days that we've had when we've been cooped up at home for the last couple of weeks this would be a great whiskey just to you know whiskey can be a refreshing drink it doesn't have to be this sit by the fireside and on a dark dingy night with the, the fire roaring and getting it down to you this is a really really nice nice dram it's packed full of vanilla but a lot of citrus flavors there for me you know and well the well, the, that video highlighted the, the Glen Live at 12 year old. The, the whiskeys in here are probably between the, the ages of eight and, eight and 10 years old. Um, Glen Livet is probably one of the most sort of popular and one of the f most famous space side distilleries, that probably alongside its neighbors, uh, Glen Fiddick and Balvenie, uh, and other, another two big distilleries there. <clears throat> the thing about uh, Glen Livet, I think they mentioned in that video, it was a date of 1824. So I think in 1823, before that, distilling in Speyside was majority of it was illegal, and then they brought in a license in that. So okay, you can make it legally, but you have to apply for a license. Uh, the owner of the the, the, the Glen Livet distillery at the time, George Smith, was yeah, that's grand. He was he wanted to do and buy the book, so he got his license, and uh, produced his whiskey. That did not go down too well with every other person in Speyside, especially all the illegal distillers. And it got to the stage that the, the, the owner of the farm where he had his distillery and uh, actually provided him a couple of guns to protect himself, essentially, like, because illegal, illicit distillers would come after him and he needed to protect it because he was doing things the right way. Um, and I suppose I suppose the government at the time would have, would have been behind that as well, you know, because essentially when you start uh, distilling legally, you're legally obliged to pay taxes and all the all the different duties, and we know what that these are like today. They're quite high. So imagine back then, you know, even even a, a small amount of money on on a whiskey back then would have been quite a, a a large amount, and nobody wanted to pay it. You know, nobody wanted to give money to the government. Times were hard as it was. You know, you know, you you grew barley in your fields to food, to make bread, and what was left over you made into alcohol for the winter, and it was. It was the bonus, wasn't it? Um, because if you think about it, if you were uh, making bread, you had yeast. So if you had barley, you can use the yeast, make a bake, you know. And all of a sudden, you you can turn your you can turn your um, your barley into something a bit more than bread. Uh, you know, your grains into something more than bread. And it's it's almost like if if you like look at it another way, you know. If you're coming in the summer, we've got this bountiful of harvest. 
you know, we're, we're coming into strawberry season and I grow fruit and vegetables, but I have an abundance of fruit and vegetables. And unfortunately, we don't have a restaurant that can use it at the moment. Um, so I, well, what do you do with it? So you pickle it. Uh, your strawberries and raspberries, you can make jam out of it. And they'll carry you through, you know, the, the autumn and, and winter seasons right through. So, so whiskey was no different. You, you grew your crop and then you, you know, you use what you can and then what was left over you. Uh, although I'm, I'm dubious of it as what was left over. I was in because, you know, what would you prefer, bread or uh, whiskey? I wonder. Um, Alan's saying there's um, been a sweet toffee and citrus fruit coming through. There's definitely, I, I get a lot of citrus. There is a bit of toffee, you know, that, that, that vanilla notes there. Um, it's very, very pleasant whiskey. Um, um, stunning whiskey. The Glenlivet produce about 6 million litres of um, alcohol a year, so you can imagine the amount of bottles they produce. It's quite, it's quite a, a number. Um, there's not much to, uh, we've done a lot of uh, expansion over the last few years since I was last there. It's been several years since I was there. Um, I'll show you just outside of the story. That's the, that's the, the distillery building there. That's, it's, it's all brand new, as you can see. It's, it's, it's relatively new. This is the still house in here. And you just move around, if I can move around. And you've got the, the lovely, beautiful visitor center. Oh, mm -hmm. this is, it, it's designed to look like an old outhouse and old outbuildings in, on a farm, but you can tell that they're, they're either someone's cleaning them every day or they're, they're relatively new. Um, 1824 on there for the, when they got granted their license there and George, George Smith's name there. Um, and then you come around to the, the ugly warehouses that nobody wants to see. And you can see that Glen, Glenlivet is at the very top of a mountain uh, near the top of what's called Ben Rins. It's quite high up and it has its own water source and it's quite, it's sort of like the furthest outpost of a distillery in Speyside. It's quite far away from anything. Getting there is quite a challenge. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a lovely whiskey. And if you, you don't, it's the sort of whiskey when you go to Scotland, you'll find in um, even the most basic bars, you would find it on the back bar alongside a Glen Liffet, uh, a Glen Fiddick, and a, say a Glen Morangi, you know. That would be like the, the house single malts, you know, you'd have your blends, your bells, your grouse, your famous your famous grouse and your teachers and whatnot. And then if you wanted to, to trade up, these would be the whiskies you'd go into. You know, most most bars in Scotland are not big whiskey bars, you know, so they have, um, you know, small amounts. But this would be the sort of like, if you were in a local bar in Scotland and you, you were drinking, your friends were drinking bells or teachers and you ordered a... If you ordered a Glen with it or a Glen Fiddick, for instance, you'd be you'd be posh. You'd be seen as you're spending money, and the, the, the difference could be something like fifty pence. That, you know, it wouldn't be it would be huge. Um, it's it's one of the it's bizarre. Scotland's one of the most few countries for some reason. The price of whiskey is cheaper than a pint of beer. And there's generally in Ireland, it's the other way around. You know, there's not many whiskies you'll find that are cheaper than beer. It's just the way it is, I suppose, it's the way it's drank. It's, I suppose the measures are a little bit smaller as well. 25 mil measures in Scotland, so I suppose there are 35 mil measures here. Um, what does everyone think of that? Is that a thumbs up? Good? Enjoy that? Yep, very nice, Michael. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Leave him here. I think it's a nice... I don't like using... I, I use it a lot, and I don't like using entry-level whiskey. Um, you know... It's a, it's a sort of whiskey that you could give to your friends that maybe don't drink whiskey. And if you're a whiskey drinker and you want to say, look, look here you are, try a whiskey. You know, there's nothing overbearing. There's nothing that goes bang. It's going to make your head explode. With, there's all this flavor going on, you know. Uh, as, as much as I love smoky whiskeys and whatnot, you, if, you would never give a, a non sort of whiskey drinker a big, massive aisle of whiskey to kick, start them off on a whiskey journey. It's, it's happened to me a few times when I was younger. And you're like, oh, that's, it, took, you know, it took me a bit of time to get into these whiskeys and understand what the smoking and what, what it's doing there. So I think this is great because there's no smoky flavor there. It's just light. It's refreshing. It's very easy 
very easy drinking. And I always say in, in Ireland, we have a, a whiskey like, like that, and that's the, the Green Spot Chateau Monsadina. It's got this it's like spritzer, sort of fresh prosecco to it. It's like that summery whiskey. And I do think it come, comes across a bit like that. And our next whiskey is quite um, similar as well. Uh, just a little bit older, but, you know, I fully matured in bourbon. So I just need to get my, my screen. And our next whiskey will be, uh, is Ben Riach. The light is not great in my twist in it, but it's a very dark label with, with sort of coppery bronze writing. I'm guessing the coppery bronze writing is to highlight the colours of sort of pot stills and you know, then beautiful kettles that are great. Like Ben Reich, I've, I've had a, a sort of on and off love affair with Ben Reich for years. Um, it's changed hands a few times in the last recent years. Um, there was a company, a, a very famous Scotch whiskey distiller, uh, Billy Walker, got involved with some South Africans and they bought the distillery. Billy Walker's pretty much a, a legend of distilling in, a, in, in Scotland and he's, he's moved around quite a bit. You know, he, he, he seems to get involved in a lot of startup. Of it, and you know, buy it low, sell it high, sort of. And so, Chris, it's a 10 year old, sorry, it's a 10 year old Ben Rake. It's just the, the, uh, the there's probably younger ones and money statement ones available, but this is the 10, which is pretty much readily available in Ireland. Um, fully, fully matured in bourbon. This is a 43% ABV. Um, and I'm, I'm actually guessing, I'd have to double check, but I'd imagine um, all. Ben Reich, uh, starts off at 43%. Uh, and I mentioned Billy Walker there. He got into to, um, business with a couple of South Africans when they, they, they bought Ben Reich. I think it was back in 2000, 2000, the late 2000s, you know, eight or nine, uh, they took over. And there's probably a reason the 43% is because of the South Africans' involvement. Obviously, if you're, if you're a, a South African businessman buying a, a Scotch whiskey distillery, you're looking at your home market. Well, we'll take this to South Africa and we can sell it there. And uh, South Africa, to sell whiskey in South Africa, ha the, the ABV has to be a minimum of 43%. So I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why it's 43%. Um, I've just poured mine into the glass. Um, so there's a question, is Ben Reich the one that the Waterford distiller is in? I'm not sure I know what you mean by that, but the guy who's in Waterford is a guy called Mark Rainier. Uh, Mark Rainier used to be co-owner of Brucladi Distillery in Iowa. And maybe that's maybe what you're thinking there. Uh, Mark is a, a colourful <laughs> Mark is a colourful colourful character and we're hoping to have him involved in our uh, whiskey festival at some stage. Um but at, at, at the moment, you probably see the, all the, the, the pictures coming out from Waterford at the moment. There's pallets of whiskey everywhere, and they're trying to, so they're probably very busy down there, which is great to see. It's great for great for uh, great for Ireland. But yeah, so yeah, so Mark Rainey at Waterford was involved in Brookwaddy. All these uh, all these Scottish uh, names can be a bit confusing. Mm. This fully matured in bourbon, probably a sort of step up in flavour, maybe uh, not as maybe as light as the, the Glen Levitt. Um, don't mean that in a, a bad way or a good way, just a different profile. Chris, you're right, there is a good bit of spice in there, isn't there? There's, I would say that it's, it's almost at the end, it hits, the, it hits the, the top of my front lip there. Uh, the top of just a little bit of spice and then it just comes around at the back of my, my throat. Um, it goes down quite easy, it doesn't burn or anything, you know. Um, and there is a bit of spiciness there. Uh, that's probably coming from that a little bit extra ABV from just gone from a 40% to 43%. And I'm saying I've fallen in and out a lot of Ben Reich over the years and when we opened the pub in Stony Batter 10 years ago now, um, put a nice selection of whiskey behind the bar and it had several Ben Reichs in the 10s, the 12s, 15s and whatnot, 18s over the years and I was a big fan of it and I decided to put a, sort of like an, an expensive whiskey behind the bar 
as something you can treat yourself to. Uh, and we got a Benry, a 30 year old, and put it behind the bar. And I was so excited. It was putting this whiskey behind the bar. It's something that I could direct people if we wanted to try something that was different and, and had a budget, maybe celebrating, you know, I want to buy this as a gift for a friend, et cetera. And um, so when you get a whiskey like that behind the bar, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to open it up and you're going to have a little, you're going to smell it, you're going to pour yourself a little bit and see what it's like. And, it was, I was so excited and it was, it wasn't very good. It was all musty. It was all, I left it in, left it in the glass for a long time. You see, you know, you know, well, it developed, well, it just didn't develop. And in the end, it's just like, mm. so we had it there, but we, we never sort of saw that then we ended up going get some other higher end, sort of expensive older whiskies is something there. And it's always the one for me that, um, it's, it sort of says to you, there's one thing you can guarantee in whiskey. As it gets older, it doesn't generally get better. But it, one thing is guaranteed is it will be more expensive. And so you think a barrel of whiskey at 10 years old is, you know, it's probably 90% full. When it gets to 30 years old, it's probably half full with evaporation. And that, that was, it was one, you know, for all the whiskeys that I've drank and had the pleasure of trying over the years, it was one, it was one of these disappointments. And then I think about two years later, I ended up, Going to the Ben Reef distillery again, um, <laughs> the, the, the distiller at the time was, was very blunt and very honest. He says, look, you guys have been on a whiskey tour for the last four days, and I'm at the end of uh, your tour. I'm one of the last distilleries on your tour. It was actually the second last distillery. And he says, you've been in all these distilleries. You've been in at least 10 of them. You know what copper pot stills look like. You know the process. You know what grist is. You know what mashing is. You know all this. He says, so you can either go and do the distillery tour or we can just go straight to the warehouse and we'll start opening casks and trying different whiskies. So that was a unanimous decision. We all went to the warehouse and um, started uh, opening casks. And that was just, I suppose, you know, you're, the romance of the moment is, is huge as well. We opened this uh, phenomenal, I think it was a 36-year-old whiskey. It was in the, it just was, been transferred into a phenol sherry cask. And phenol sherry would not be something in a whiskey that I'm a fan of in sherry. I, I like sherry, the big fruity, the pedo Jimenez, the all Russells. You know, phenol can be almost a little tangy, a little bit salty. Uh, but this was just simply stunning. It was just an amazing. And it was like, well, if you like that, then you opened another one next to it. And it was, I think it was a different sherry in Montelado, and it was a 38 year old. We're just all sitting there, just absolutely blown away by this. And we're at the end of our whiskey tour, and it's, you know, there's a, you're, you're nearly at the stage where there's casualties because you've, you've had too much whiskey, you've been so many distilleries. That at that stage, your suitcase is full, you've got so many bottles, and you're like, man, we, can't. we went, all went back to the, the distillery shop, and I think everybody on the tour bought a version of a Ben Rea, um, just quality stuff. That, and I think. I actually brought a second bottle back and I, I, I sold it to the bar, Balls, everybody knows at this stage, that's where I drink. Um, and they've always got a bottle of Ben Rake in their cabinet as a special whiskey. They've, you know, we've got every year, we don't sell a bottle every week, so every year they'll order another Ben Rake for the cabinet. And I think they've got a 1976 Ben Rake in there at the moment and it's simply stunning. It does come with a stunning price. I think it's about 60 or 70 euro. Um, but one of, I think myself and Mary, you weren't here after Christmas Eve. It's a busy day in the whiskey shop. And we close a little bit early and we take the staff for a drink. But all the staff were tired and only one of them joined me was Michael Waller, something you're fair, familiar with. I went down to Bose and, you know, I says, look, you know, I, it's your Christmas drink. What would you like? And something from the cabinet. And in, immediately pumped for the Ben Rea 76. And, so you've all had one of them. It's, it's a simply stunning whiskey. And I think to get good whiskey like that, you need good good whiskey like this to start it all off. You know, if it's if it's good like this, you know, I, I I sort of put down that 30 year old we had in the bar as, as a one off mistake that happened. Um but this is it's got great structure, it's really, really nice. It, it, way on your right, it's quite a lot richer, you know. You'd almost think there was a bit, um, 
some sort of sherry cask going on there. And it, it's actually quite, you know, look at the bottle, it's, full, it's still quite dark enough, you know. Um, it's, it's a thoroughly enjoyable whiskey, actually. Um, I, 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 I'm going to have to hide that. I've got the full bottle here. I'm going to have to take that back to the, the bar and otherwise it, it may get, um, it may not last the weekend. <laughs> um, I think some of it, from a price point of view, I think our first whiskey is in the, the 40 to 50 mark. This is probably, in, I think this is 60, 55 to 60 euro. Um, it's a really nice whiskey actually. What's the, the, the thought on this, anybody? Don't be shy. Feel free if you want to unmute yourself and give us your thoughts. I can't too much. I can't. So, Liam, I think that's you're talking. You're, you're you're just breaking up quite a bit there. I can't get you. Um, I don't know. If it, if, like these first two whiskies, I'm. I'm sort of probably guessing you may not have had them before. You may have had a version of them. Um, Just before I left it outside in front, where's me? Uh, Thanks for doing yourself some chips. No, I didn't. No. You don't want to know what Tom's doing with his chips. <laughs> uh, the, the joy of unmuting yourself, eh? Make sure. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. We'll move on to to, to, to whiskey three, and hopefully you won't be getting any salt and vinegar flavors off of this. Um, so whiskey number three is so I have to find myself on on the, the scroll bar here. Is a uh, Cardu, and uh, um, it's the fifteen year old. Okay, and this is forty percent ABV as well. Um, Really interesting fact about Cardo is owned by Diageo. Diageo own um, what the, they own about twenty eight distilleries in Scotland. Twenty eight or twenty nine? The, the, sorry, the number is eluding me there. I think it's twenty eight distilleries in Scotland, possibly twenty nine. And <laughs> if you think um, if you think that um, Diageo also own whiskies such as Lagavulin. Uh, Kalila, which I tried a few weeks ago, uh, Talisker, Oban. These are some big, big names in the whiskey, in the Scotch whiskey industry. And if I was to say to you, what is Diageo's number one selling malt globally? I think we'd all say probably Talisker or Lagavulin, you know, maybe, maybe Oban. Um, but Talisker and, and Lagavulin would certainly be on a lot of people's lists. It'd be like that. One of these questions on a quiz show, you know, you have to rank them in order. But um, Cardo is Diageo's number one selling single malt in the world. Um, primarily for that is way back when Diageo were called UDV, United Distillers and Vinters. They took Cardo to Spain and it was sort of like one of the only whiskies that would be readily available in Spain. You know, as a, in, as a single malt, and the Spanish went mad for it. And I think you know, when we look at the, the numbers and saying it's their number one selling single malt in the world, in the world for their brands, uh, Scotch whiskies, um, this the seventy five percent of it is sold in Spain, uh, a huge amount in um, in um, in France as well, uh, probably at the younger and it's it's courted a lot of controversy. So you know, look at the the, the name there. Cardo, the, 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 the DU at the end of its name. Um, the actual farm is Cardo, and it's, uh, the, the DU is C A R D. The H U is dropped and an O W was put in. And so at one stage, Cardo Distillery, the whiskey we we're going to try, couldn't keep up with production to satisfy the Spanish market. 
So, you know, what do you do? You, you've got to get whiskey there. People want to buy it. You've not got enough. Um, you could put the price up, but then it'd be a, bit, a little bit harder for people to buy. You probably collapse demand because Spain wouldn't be a country with a wash of money. We, we all know when you go on holidays, the price of the beer and all that wine and everything is more than half the price. You know, different tax laws, so it's very hard to put to jack up the price. So they they created a it was called Cardo Pure Malt, dropping the single malt because single malt is malt whiskey from one distillery. And they introduced pure malt and just changed the, the last two letters on the bottle. And it was a sort of brand, when this happened, it caught so much controversy, people, you know, telling off, giving out about it. You can't be doing this, can't be doing this. And at the end of the day, there was sort of no legislation on it at the time. So they could do what they want. And the idea is people in Spain probably didn't know any the wiser. They were buying the whiskey thinking they're getting cardu, but they're getting whiskey from other distilleries in the bottle. It wouldn't all mean cardu, it bulked out with other stuff. So it's all, it was a blend of malts. And it's caught the controversy over the years, what you can put on, on a label of a bottle. Was it single malt? Was it blended malt? The pure malt was was rubbish straight away, you know, because, you know, what does that mean? So the caught the controversy, but it's, it's quite strange that you think that, you know, this whiskey, this whiskey is so popular worldwide, and it, generally see it as a twelve-year-old. This is the fifteen-year-old. Um, I'm going to pour, pour myself a, a wee measure there, and, so, and I've got it in the glass. It's a lot more richer and darker in colour um, than our previous two. You know, that's, that's a good bit extra maturation there. There's, there's a, a, probably a bit of sherry maturation in there. There's, there's a, a little bit musty actually. Some some nice flavours come. There's a lot coming out of that, you know. It's not, uh, there's almost tropical flavours coming on here. It's the there that it's almost like a you know these flavours you get out of Sauvignon Blanc, New Zealand, these gooseberries and these passion fruits. They're not in abundance like it's sort of like in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, but they're there. Uh, it's almost to me you know, if you drink wine. Um, I'm not the biggest wine drinker, but from a wine point of view, if you compare some of your wines from France to New Zealand, New Zealand are a bit more full flavoured and more full on, with nosing and tasting. It's almost like a Sancerre, it's, you know, the the the, the some of your from France. It's a it's a lighter there. They're just there, but they're not going to go bang and explode your nose. So there's, you know, I get these. Right, Ed's got it there. You mint. There is a bit of mintiness there. There's a wee, wee faint hint of smoke in there when you taste it as well. Just, bit, it's very, very subtle. So, uh, you know, with, with whiskey here, you know, in, in Speyside, when they, they use a little bit of peated malt in um, distillation, uh, and you know, but not a massive amount. We we're talking phenol parts per million. That's how you measure the, the, the sort of the smoking level of whiskey ppm, as we say. The ppm here is about two or three, if that you know. And if you look at Lagavulin, and we've mentioned and Kalila, they're in the, the 30s and the 40s, and your your and your Roigs are up above 40. Yeah, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It's not like a lot more cloying on the mouth. A lot more. Sticked inside your gums and your, your, it really clings to your, your palate. You know, it's it's a, a tiny, a little bit oiliness in there as well. You know, I think from that, there's a lot, it's a good bit of viscosity in it. Um, it's, it's coming from just that. It's a, it's a good bit older. Um, it's it's a whiskey that. <laughs> It's bizarrely enough that I wouldn't really order. We have a few bottles in the shop. But I've actually had a bottle of this during um, in lockdown. It was sort of to remind me. I'd um, uh, done this thing over the last few few weeks and months that drinking whiskey that reminds you of being on the holiday. Um, 
So I drank lots of young whiskey to remind me when on my holidays in Italy, which is sort of my preferred destination for a vacation, uh, is Italy. But I like going to Spain now and again as well. Um, if you go to Spain and you're on holiday, you, you'll always find a bottle of Cardew somewhere. So um, I, I took a bottle of Cardew home, sort of just to remind me of being on holiday in Spain because you know, we won't be going anywhere this year, I don't think. Um, I have um, the Google Maps of uh, Cardew. There's not much to see, but I'll, I'll show you anyway. Um, it's, a, it's very different from, uh, see when we send the Glen Livet there. Um, uh, bar the nice fancy house there. And if you look, at, <laughs> look around around here, it's quite modern building. It's obviously it's 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 refurb uh, and been done up. But it's, it's expansion. If you're if you've got such demand from Spain and France, you know, they'll expand to make to make more. But you come around to the old stone warehouses. Um, I love looking at old stone warehouses. It's a bit sad. But if you look around here, especially at the top of them, these ones here, you can see this sort of black blackness of the bricks compared to down here. It's still a blackness around the, the sorry the windows. Well, the windows are black, but they're deliberate. But around the edges of the windows are quite black. And, you know, we all know about angel share and evaporation of whiskey over years in time. And you see all these stone buildings and distilleries and the warehousing, you always see this black fungus on the walls. And, and that's part of the, it's part of the sort of evaporation process that this black mold peers on, on the buildings. Um, I've always wondered what it'd be like to... Uh, climb up a ladder and uh, lick the wall and see if it actually tasted of whiskey. I very much doubt it does. And um, God, if I'd done that, you'd probably, it'd probably cause another coronavirus. So probably, probably not um, advised. Um, but these are like, if you looked at the, the Glen Livet buildings, they were obviously very new. You can see that you can quite see, see the old stone here. They've been around for years and years and years, you know. Uh, old and new sort of there. Probably the new buildings from the 80s by the looks of them. Um, what does people think of that one? Now, William says a bit of richer, more dark fruits. Uh, lighter fruits, tropical ones, yeah. I, I do get a lot of tropical notes off of that, and they're a bit they're, they're hard to come out. Um, I say like a little touch of water would bring these fruits out a bit more. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save uh, my water for my for the last whiskey. It is a bit sweeter, and yeah, it does have a. Um, so you say in Scotland we have a we have a, uh, a, a delicacy or a, or a or a dentist nightmare. It's called tablet. I don't know if you're any anyone's uh, familiar with Scottish tablet. It's essentially sugar condensed milk boiled in a pan and left to set and then it sets and it's not doesn't set like toffee you, know, you get it to the right uh temp you have to get it right temperature and it's sort of this crumbly sugary delicacy um it's the reason why i've had all my teeth redone because for many years tablet and iron brew as a child was the normal thing in scotland um but that, that for me that's what it has it has that sort of buttery tablet texture that's butter and sugar and you know that and then it clings to your mouth and it lingers there for a long time and uh, just a waft the smoke just fucking it just gliding past it just mm, giving it a bit mm. that's 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 lovely our our next few whiskies that we'll come into um we'll, we'll break in a minute or two is um Really nice. I'll let you know what the, the, the next one is. We're coming to sort of sherry maturation style. I thought we'd do it in two halves, so, so to speak. So we've gone from a non-age statement to a 10-year-old to a 15-year-old. We're going to come back down and we're going to go to a non-age statement. In fact, bizarrely enough, the last three are non-age statement, but I can tell you, I allude to the, the ages of them a lot more um, with them and some cracking flavours. I think it's... 
the next wee whiskey, the, the showcase a lot of flavour that you wouldn't necessarily expect with non-age statements. Because we expect non-age statements to be young whiskies. And don't get me wrong, there's lots of non-age statement whiskies that they're very old. But at the same time, as I've already mentioned, that the only good thing about old whiskies that you can guarantee is the price is going to go up. But uh, we'll take a, a, a five minute break. But our next whiskey, if you, if you want to get it ready, is the Singleton of Dufftown. Uh, and that, the brand of that is Tailfire. And that is 40% as well. Uh, nice little background stories on these as well. It's another Diageo whiskey, uh, but we'll come to that in a, a few moments. So we're just coming for quarter past eight. So if you don't have to leave the meeting room, you can just put yourself on mute and hide your video and whatnot. Uh, but we'll come back at 20 past and we'll, we'll get into the, the next three whiskies. So welcome back everybody, um, stay at home part two. So I already showed you um, the whiskey that we're going to have, which is the Singleton, and that's the single malt whiskey of Dufftown. Um, so the Singleton, the, the brand itself, the name Singleton, is not a name of any single distillery in Scotland. Um, I've actually, the singleton name on the bottle appears quite large, but just here is the actual name of the distillery, and it's the Dufftown Distillery, which is in the town of Dufftown in, in, in Speyside. And Dufftown, for, for years, we used to say Rome was built on seven hills, and Dufftown was built on seven stills. And then um, it was always a sort of canyon name, the, the seven stills of Dufftown, the seven distilleries. It's always a question that was always posted uh, with work colleagues over the years. Um, and it's quite a hard, actually quite a hard question to answer because there's 50 distilleries, over 50 distilleries in Speyside, so you've got them all running through your head. But if someone was to ask you, what are the eight distilleries of Isla? You'd get them a lot quicker because there is only eight. You know, it's trying to... But the, the Singleton brand, this, from, this one is from the Dufftown distillery. The Singleton brand was brought around in, the, I think, the late 80s, probably the, I think, even the early 90s. And it was created uh, for a, a whiskey brand called, a whiskey distillery called Ochroisk. Um, it's very easy for me to say it, uh, but if I was to give you the, the, I'll type it in the message and actually, actually how it's, Um, if you were to try it, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm in, I sent that privately to someone. I'll just give it back to everybody. Um, that's there. That's it there in the, in the chat. Och, Royce. So it's a very, if you look at that, that word, you know, if I hadn't said it, you'd be like, how would you pronounce that? It's, nobody could really pronounce it. And then, um, this Och Royce went into lots of different Diageo blends, um, most famously J and B. You know the just the ring and Brooks, the the yellow label with the big garish red letters on it. Uh, it looked like a it was a green bottle with a yellow label and red letter, and it looked like a traffic light had gone wrong. Um, that's that's just the ring with the J and B. But Och Royce was um, it was like, well, how do we sell this as a single malt? You know, nobody can pronounce it. So they, they created a, a brand called The Singleton. And um, so it's evolved from being The Singleton of Loch Royce um, into a few different different singletons. I think at one stage there were six. I think they're back down to three at the moment. Um, I have uh, Liam Smith says, I have a singleton of Loch Royce. Liam, that's, you're a very lucky man. As, as people who know me, I, I, I'm probably the worst whiskey collector in the world. Um, I get so much put in front of me that sometimes I don't actually know what I want to what to drink and what to keep and what to sell on um, and I, I actually buy and sell whiskey for a lot of people um, you have some portfolios and I, I, I buy and sell it for them to make some money off it and I'm very good at that for them but for, for me I, I'm terrible at it and I, I actually had a, a singleton of Ocroisk as well I, I, I 
bought it for very little money, but I opened the bottle and drank it. And I think that that bottle of Singleton of Hawk Royce is actually, if it's, if it's sealed, Liam, it's probably worth a few quid these days. You know, it's, you know, you'd want it, you, if you, if you want No, to it's open. It. I've, I'm, I'm about, about a third of the way through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if it was a sealed bottle, you know, you, you, you could do quite well out of it. And I'm, I'm terrible at that. I, I seem to be, a, I'd be, a, be this person who has this great ability to open bottles of whiskey that I shouldn't. But then I'm, a, I'm always one for whiskeys for drinking as well. Um, so the, the Singleton brand was for, for Och Royst. And then there was another, there was the Cardew bottle was that square dumpy bottle of Diageo. They also had a, a distillery called Glenord. And they're still doing it. Glenord is actually not just a distillery. It's a big malting place, a big malting plant where the Agile bought a lot of their barley for a few of their other distilleries in Scotland. So it came out as the Singleton of Glenord. You can still find that. Uh, the, the Singleton of Glendullen. And if any of you are familiar with a, a range of whiskies that Diageo launched last year, on a, it was based on a TV show that some of you might have heard of it, Game of Thrones. And uh, so the, the Game of Thrones, they, they had a, a whiskey from Glendullen distillery in that set. And it was, I think it was even called the Singleton of Glendullen on whatever under whatever brand in the Game of Thrones was under on the bottle. <coughs> and then um, Duff Town as well, uh, as we have here, the Duff Town distillery. Uh, sort of um, not as well known distillery in Duff Town because in Duff Town you've got Glenfiddich, Balvenie. Uh, Mortlach. So you've got some big, big name distilleries in, in Dufftown. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share just like a, a screen of. You can't go in with the, the Google Map man, but we will share a screen of Dufftown uh, in a second here. So this is sort of Dufftown in here, right? It's just. It's almost like a small grid system, you know, a mini New York. And if I move down here, you know, we can see Balvenie up here. Yeah, Caninvi is a, is a, a sort of newish story that, <coughs> that really, William Grant's who owned Balvenie and Glenfiddich down here. They, they built this on the sort of same sort of area. Uh, the Lost Park Mortar story. According to Google, Google Maps, it's lost, but we can all find it because we can all see it on the screen there. And this is used as warehousing now for <coughs> a company called Murray McDavid. And as Anne mentioned earlier on about Mark Rainey from Waterford, Murray McDavid was his whiskey brand from his wine shop he used to own in London. Uh, I'm not sure if he's still involved in the Murray McDavid brand, but they're independent bottlers and would buy whiskey from different distilleries and bottle them under their own name. And if you move a little bit south and Past Dufftown, we've got the Mortlach distillery here, Dufftown, and the Lost Pirivaic distillery. Uh, it's not lost either because it's, it's on our screen. Uh, the, what you what you can see is all these buildings here. You know, you can that's all warehousing. Uh, but it, it, it's sort of it's sort of lost because unless you're driving, uh, and you know, you're only you're only going to drive out to it like. From the Dufftown clock tower here, so this is the bus terminus, and that's where if I was going to Dufftown, I'd get off the bus there. I don't drive. So I'd get off the Dufftown clock tower. So you can sort of easily walk to Mortlach. They don't normally do tours, so but you can get some by pre-arrangement. So you'd walk down there. It's easy enough to walk, but that's still a 10-minute walk there. So if you think that's probably about you know, a 20-minute walk down there. So it's sort of forgotten about, especially when you've got Mortlach, which is very well thought of, and then big hitters like Balvenie and Glen Finnick there, you know. Um, <clears throat> even the old railway station is actually midway between Balvenie and Glen Finnick, the Keith and Dufftown Railway. That would have been a, 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 b before the, the beaching cuts in the 60s, that would have been a very important stop for Dufftown. would have made it a lot easier um, to get to. Um, but we'll go into the whiskey. Uh, Singleton Tailfire. Um, the tail fire, what would you expect when you think of fire? You think racing spiciness, richness, roaring, giving it loads. Um, so it's quite a young whiskey, but it's lots of sherry maturation in this. It's quite fruity, it's spicy. It's. Um, I once described this as drinking liquid ginger. 
it's, it's, it has a bit of a, um, a rubbery note uh, that I'm never a fan of in whiskey, but it, it does come from some some sherry casks you get. In, uh, when you're getting sherry casks from Spain, the one thing that you, you want is just the sherry cask. And you want it sent over to you from Spain, either as a whole entity or broken down. Uh, a lot of them would be sending over as whole entities, a big barrel, um, and it would take a lot, of a lot of transportation to move. So you can only send so many at a time, but they're big things, about 500 litres, you know. But Spanish uh, sherry bodegas have this habit of putting a thing called a sulphur candle in a barrel to preserve it. And uh, when if you, if you put a sulphur candle in a barrel, it, it can generally taint the whiskey and you put whiskey in it afterwards. And a very famous whiskey writer, Jim Murray, always alludes to, oh, I'm getting sulphur off this sherry cask. Oh, it's rubbish. It's, oh, it's this, that, and the next thing. Uh, and he's quite vocal on it. You know, he, he seems to be able to put sulphur out of everything. Uh, Whereas I always pick up like a rubbery note, like a car tire note. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I wouldn't generally say it's a good thing either. But you do get a bit of that, that rubberiness there. But give it a taste and see. It's the first thing that grabs me, it's very spicy on my lips. Um, almost a gingery spice, you know. Um, for me, that's um, quite a, a youthful whiskey, and but it's always good to see youthful whiskey with the, a, a dollop of sherry maturation in there to see what that sherry is like when it's young and fiery. And probably hence the name Tail Fire. Um, drinking it's really nice. It's actually a really nice drop. Um, I'm not convinced on the nose. There is that sort of that burnt rubber there, it just puts me off a little bit. You get you get it on a few whiskies, but based on that, so probably that sherry, sulfury candle thing that they put in the barrel. So if, you know, you, you know, if you look at um, any wines that you buy, if you look at the back of the label, it probably says may contain sulfites. Similar thing. It's, it's you use sulfur, sulfur because it's used as for preserving. But if you ever actually um, smelt sulfur in its own form it smells of rotten eggs it's one of the most horrible things in uh, and i alluded to it. i go to italy quite a lot uh, i go down to, around the, the bay of naples and the Alfie coast and there's a big sort of volcano there kind of vesuvius I and mean, you ever go to the top of vesuvius and stick your head over and smell it it smells of rotten eggs because it's full of sulfur just coming through you know um, Chris is saying a tiny drop of water brings it more out. It most likely does. It'll probably get you past that. It tastes amazing. Don't get me wrong. It tastes amazing, but there's just a bit of a weird nose to it. Red berries are probably more aligned to, I'd say more like a black currently, you know, like, um, not a raspberry, what's the, the blackberries, you know, these bramble berries that you'd, you'd find in hedge growth, hedge growth and all that. That's that's sort of the berries I'd be getting out of that, you know. They're, they're very subtle. Um, still can't, still can't, I keep nosing it and I don't know why, because I don't like the nose on it, but I keep nosing it. Um, I think I'm just trying to figure out what it is. From a taste point of view, um, what what do you think of it? Is it? It is quite a young whiskey. It's probably about the seventy seven seven year old mark, eight year old mark. You know, um, not a fan. The spice eases after a few sips. Yeah, that that first. It's almost you would never eat a nettle, but if you ate a nettle and you kept eating nettles, eventually. You'd be uh, you'd be okay with them, you know. You'd get past that sort of <clears throat> that jagginess of it. You know? I actually think it's a it's a nice whiskey. It's just getting past the nose for me. Is um, 
that's where that's for me like who's the first thing you're going to do with the whiskey is you're going to you're going to smell it before you taste it and your nose is always going to tell you what to expect what you want what you're going to taste and um you know if you were smelling the sort of first thing oof, not too sure about that now you know uh, when you get past that there is there is something going on there isn't there is a nice whiskey in there uh, the abv is 40 percent you know, um, It's, it's nice enough. Would I, would I order in a bar? Would I buy it again? Yeah, possibly. Possibly. It's just, you're trying to get past that. For me, it's trying to get past that nose. And it has a lot going for it, but, you know, if you, if you, were, you were ticking boxes on what a whiskey should be about, it should have a really good nose. It should smell really nice. It should taste really nice. And after you finish drinking it, it should still be there. It should be lingering. It should be feeling it. You know, it should be like the flavor should last. Um, for me, it definitely takes box number two. The flavors there, um, does it last? It's, it's quite dry. My mouth is quite dry now, so it's not, it's not, it's not hanging around too long. You know, that's you know, it's most likely because young, young, young whiskey. It's not matured enough. It's not got so many components from the the, the, the oak. Um, so different, a little bit different. Is it going to be our best whiskey tonight? Probably not. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to whiskey number five, um, which is a version of a whiskey we had on our first space out tasting. Um, I wasn't expecting much from it, and when I started drinking it during the last tasting, it was actually really pleasant, really enjoyable. It was, it was a really, really nice whiskey. Um, we, we've done a bit of the Google Map share and we showed the distillery because it's, it's quite a new distillery built in the 60s. So the, 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 the distillery website shows this lovely picture of a nice little building, like all these fancy little outhouses. And behind it is an actual real distillery. It's just like a production plant. It doesn't look the best. Um, it's uh, Tam the um, this is This is a different one, a version to the one we had and the, the previous Spirit Home tasting. Uh, this is 40% ABV as well. And this is the double cask version. So matured in American oak barrels with a, a sherry cask finish. So this is finished in sherry, whereas the previous time the brewing had a, a maturation of both and then they were combined it together. So this has got a little bit, uh, this is eight to 10 years old. So I'm gonna say it's about seven and a half years in bourbon maturation and then six, six months to a year in the sherry. Uh, it does come well in the colour. It really, it really does. And from what I can tell, there's there's no caramel colouring in it at all. Um, I'm gonna pour myself a little bit of this. Um, like I said, this this was the this was a standout whiskey um, in our last tasting. Uh, and if you think in our last tasting, we had some big hitting names. From space, I made Glen Fiddick and made McCallan. You know, um, this this like stood head and shoulders. They went toe to toe with the big boys and came out on top. It was the the, the whiskey of the whiskey of the evening. So nice to see what a different version of it is. And uh, will we sort of still have the same vibe about it? Is it is it is it as good as um, as that previous one? It's an extremely hard whiskey. To uh, to get in Ireland, um, we inadvertently a supplier had some and we just ordered it off spec and it, it appeared and it was there and there was a couple of bottles of it, um, and all this was actually destined for our hip flask service or something a little bit different for people to try, uh, but it's made our way to two of our tastings now. It's really fresh and citrusy on the nose. It's like, compared to our previous whiskey, we're two non-age statement whiskeys from the same area. They're, they're chalk and cheese. I'm getting sort of like fresh citrus, I'm getting oranges, you know, not lemons or anything like that, but I'm getting this big orangey, that marmalade. I think someone mentioned marmalade with another whiskey there. Here I'm getting big, big amounts of marmalade. Mm. 
I don't know what anyone else thinks, but it doesn't fail, does it? It doesn't fail to deliver it. You know, the nose is, you could sit in nose this all night, whereas the last one you couldn't. There's lots of going on in the nose. And then you, you, you bring it and you, you, you bring it up and you, you drink it. Let it sit in your mouth for a, a, a few seconds and, and then let it go down. You feel a, feel a little bit, a tiny warmth coming down your, from your throat. But after I've drank it, you know, I could sit here. If I don't drink this for another minute, I'll still be tasting it. So it's ticking in boxes, like I said. It's got a good nose, it's got a good flavour, and it's got a good finish. It's, it's, it's so well balanced. Um, and it, 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 it's so unknowing in the whiskey industry uh, or from whiskey consumers, set most certainly in Ireland because we, we never see it. Um, and even, even in the UK, I, I actually, I, I don't know which markets they, they go to, you know. The, you know, the thing, if, you, if you're a whiskey distiller and you're producing a couple of million bottles a year, a couple of million bottles sounds like a lot. But, you know, if you pick a country like, say, um, Taiwan or somewhere in Korea or you know, parts of Asia, you can happily satisfy a whole market with your, your production for one year. So you don't need to go everywhere. It's only when you start upping your game and when doing, you know, several millions of bottles, you know, the five and six millions. But to be honest, then, you know, when I say millions, I, I doubt Tam and everyone produce a million bottles a single malt a year anyway. A lot of it would go to blending uh, for other brands. And I think it's really good to see because we've had all the all the big names in whiskey, you know, the, the Glen Fiddicks, the McCallans, the Glen Livets, the Balvenies, your Lager Villains, your Talisker's. They've got this sort of international market. Everybody knows their brand. And then you see some new brands coming out. And um, they're bringing them out and they come out and, you know, oh, what's that? What's on? Is, is it going on? You know? And they sort of get overshadowed and forgotten about. But I actually reckon if, if Tam the Villain sort of come to Ireland, it, it would hold its own, you know, with whiskey consumers and drinkers. Because for me, it takes a lot of work. Because we sent, like, you know, entry level whiskeys when given to your friends who may not drink whiskey. You know, so try this, you know. This is sort of something. So you can try this. You know, if you like it, it doesn't break, it won't break the bank on price. Something like this is probably only like, I think in the UK, you can actually buy this for £22 a bottle. Um, and if you, if you get that in the right week when it's on discount somewhere, it'll be pretty cheap. It's probably, like, I think it's about 40, 45 euro with ourselves. It's not priced up for the shop because it was always bought for the hit last service. Because um, we only had a couple of bottles, so there's no point in, in sort of putting it, putting it on the shelf. Um, so it takes a lot of boxes there, you know, it's affordable, it tastes nice, there's no mad flavours going on, it's not going to, ooh, and it drinks really nice, it drinks easy, you know, I, I would certainly come back to this, I'd certainly come back to this again. So I was asking, what's the exact name? The exact name is Tamna Vulin. Um, I've, I did explain what Tam the Villain means. I think Villain means like a house or a field. Um, uh, for I'm, I've completely forgot. <laughs> Hold my hands up, I'm saying sorry. Um, I'd have to look back on our, our previous uh, spay tasting and tell exactly what it means. Um, but it, it, it was an old, the story was an old cotton mill. So, oh, that's it. Villain means mill. Um, so like if, other names like Lagavulin, no, that was it, the mill. The villain is the mill. And so Tam the villain was the mill. And uh, Tam the villain used to be an old cotton mill, I think. Not, not cotton, yarn mill where you make uh, fabrics. Um, and then it, it, they just turned it into a distillery. Um, so I think it's a really nice whiskey. But I, personally, I think I've saved the best for last. Um, it's I already told you, it's sixty percent ABV, but um, 
it's an absolute stunner of a whiskey. It just, I love this stuff. In fact, I love all the whiskies that this, this company produce. And, you know, you go to, most distilleries will have their core brand, whether it's a 12 year old or a 15 or a 16. And you mentioned Lagavulin. The core Lagavulin 16, and you bring it special expressions like a 12 year old or an eight year old. And Glenfinnick is a 12 year old. Balvenie is a 10 year old. Um, Cardu would be a 12 year old, we had a 15. This distillery has a 10, a 12, a 15, a 17, a 21, a 25, and then it has God knows how many expressions going back to the 50s that you can, if you've got a fat enough wallet, you can buy them. Um, but it's Glen Farquhar's. So we on the Glen Farquhar's 105, um, and it's, it's almost a, a legendary whiskey. It's 60% ABV, uh, I'll mention, so you're probably wondering what 105 is. Um, so Glen Farquhar's were doing cast friend whiskey back in the 60s and they bottled it as Glen Farquhar's 105 then. 105, um, if, you, if you're familiar with American alcohol proof, so if we were like a 40% alcohol by volume ABV in Ireland, it'd be 80% proof in America. It's exactly double. Uh, but the, prior to met, the metric system coming in in the late 70s, early 80s, um, it, was a, it was a different way of measuring alcohol. So 105 would have been the proof at the time, which translated into the metric is up to date of 60%. So that's why the 105 is in the bottle. You'll see things like Springbank 100, you know, and other, other, you know, to convert it back to that's what it is. But essentially, you know, it's quite prominent on the label, cast strength. Um, I love the fact that it says Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. But this is a Speyside whiskey tasting. And um, the regions of Scotland, have you, they're breaking them up into six. I alluded to Springbank there. And Campbelltown is a region in the south of Scotland. It's a little old dog leg there. Isla, we've talked about. It's another region. Then you have the islands. You're an island tasting. So that's a region of all the rounded islands of Scotland. Then you have the lowlands of Scotland, south of Glasgow and Dundee, if you were to draw a Marjorie line, I mean, below that lowlands. Anything above this a Marjorie line, between Glasgow and Dundee, it's called the Highlands. Within the Highlands, you have a sub-region called Speyside. And it's only fair that it has a, it has a, has a, a sub-region because there's so many distilleries within that region. But a lot of Speyside distilleries don't say Speyside on the label. They'll say Highland because technically they're right because they're in the, they're in the Highland region, but Speyside is a sub-region. So this is a Speyside whiskey. And like all Speyside whiskies, they're also in the Highland region as well. So it can be confusing if you're having these like pub arguments. Oh no, it's not a Speyside, it's a Highland. It's actually both. So 60% ADV, it's quite, it's going to give you a bang for your buck when you, you try it. Um, I just have to empty my glass there. Um, as you can see, this bottle's had a, had a little bit of damage to it, as in it's been some liquid's been taken out of it over the last few days. Um, I was doing my research. So I was, uh, you know, nosing and sniffing it for the last few days and it all evaporated because it was so strong. And that's a lie, I was drinking it all. Of course I was drinking it all. Um, so Henry, Henry said you got a bottle this a couple of weeks ago. I remember sending that to you. Uh, I think it's nice to drink neat, even though it's 60%. It is, and, and I suppose now, after we've drank um, Michael Shear, definitely. I think after uh, having five whiskies, um, it'd be more, a lot more approachable. If this was our first whiskey tonight, we'd probably like sensory overload and we'd be like, oh, gone, and we wouldn't even smell anything. So if you're sniffing this, just be careful. Don't just go bang, no straight in. You'll, uh, you'll numb the, your senses in your nose here for a couple of minutes. I don't want to do that. Just be, yeah, and Chris has just mentioned that then. Want to sniff from the side unless you want to scorch yourself. And it is too, it will, it will just, and you'll numb your nose and it'll take a couple of minutes for it to come back before you smell again. You'll just be careful then. You know, you don't have to stick your nose in straight away. Just, you, you bring it to you gradually, you know, and swirl it around your glass and, 
do that. You know, you know, easily get the flavours without that alcohol burn on your nose. Um, but uh, tuck in, enjoy, uh, and be honest and you what you like. Well, I was telling all oh, you to get some water just ready, just in case. I forgot to get my own water. Mm. But um, I think I'm, I'm probably acclimatised it after uh, having a few drams of this during the week. Uh, I love Glen Farkas um, as a distillery as a whole. They do a lot of um, sherry whiskey. Um, we actually had a Glen Farkas tasting in November 2019, just last year. It was our last event in the shop before Christmas. And um, <laughs> they, 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 they said, yeah, we'll do a tasting. We'll do the 10, we'll do the 12, the 15, the 17, the 21. That'll be great. And, you know, and they said, oh, we're going to bring this thing called the family cask over. We're going to bring a bottle of family cask. And the family cask got all the way back, I think, till 1950. And it's one of a year. So those in the 50s and 60s, you know, I think they're about 10, 12,000 a bottle. And as you come into the 80s, you get into the, the stage with about eight, 900 a bottle, still expensive whiskies. So they said, oh, we'll bring a family class. And said, oh yeah, they'll be bringing one from the 80s. They'll be bringing one from the 80s. That'll be a you know, be nice, nice whiskey, you know. Something that they have a lot of, you know, that they can sell. No, I think they, they, they brought one from the 70s. It, what was it, a 40 year old, so, late 70s anyway to buy a bottle it was like five grand and they brought this bottle and opened it and poured it to everybody in the room and and i think i think the tasting cost like 30 quid or 35 euro <laughs> and you know everybody got a measure of this whiskey that was like worth five times as much it was stunning and you know uh, i think i think everybody was speechless michael it was unbelievable <laughs> i was actually ill and i was at home and um, I stayed at home, and then Stuart and Mary were texting me. They brought this whiskey. They brought this whiskey, and I could barely walk. And I, I, I hops on these fucking crutches, jumps in a taxi. I've got to get down here. Do you imagine like one of the owners of the whiskey shop is not there, and this people have brought this five grand bottle of whiskey along? And you're like, oh. So the time we got there, we got every myself arranged to get there. They were leaving, but I managed to catch them as they were leaving. We stood out in the front door in the middle of November. It was mild enough, in fairness. And we were chatting, and chatting to these guys, and we said, hey, blah, blah. And what even struck me even more, the madness of this event, and it's actually quite a sad and somber moment, the presenter had a, a member of his family had died the day before. I'd still flew over to Ireland that morning to come and present and then went back that night, got the last fight back out, back to Scotland. And you're just going, you didn't have to do that. And he says, I've committed to doing this. I will do this. And I was blown away by this. And you're just like, it was a whole sort of, what's going on here? This is epic and the respect and, you know, just phenomenal. So we're hoping to get them back involved again. You know, I don't know if they'll be bringing more five grand bottles over for us, but hopefully. Um, but what I like about it is, is you see uh, whiskey brands, they change the label in every four or five years, you know, to make up the trend. This branding has been along around, it's, it's quite hard to see, but the actual red part of the Glen Park was there. They haven't changed it as long as I, I've been drinking whiskey. And I think this branding goes back probably to the 60s. They just haven't changed it. That's what they do. And this is what it is. And... Yeah, they're a little bit old school. Um, if you go go to the distillery, it's one of these places where you know, we get welcomed in. You know, like if you do the normal tour, it's the normal tour, and that's what you get the tourist tour. But if you're going there as a visitor, and you've you've you arranged to meet them from 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 a business sort of side of view, okay, we'll do the they'll do the tour of the distillery. But before that, come on to the office. You go into the office and you have tea and sandwiches. And it's the old traditional sandwich, it's ham and mustard, it's cheese and onion, cheese and tomato, and egg and cress. <laughs> you, get, you get this old fashioned experience. And it's a fa it's one of the last family owned distilleries in Scotland. It's still family owned. It's from the, the Grant family, not to be confused with William Grants, who owned Glenfiddich and Balvenie, but it is the Grant family. Grant is a popular name in Scotland, and it's like Brown in England or 
etc. And but they just have this overwhelming ability of really of tr traditional hospitality. You know, it's like going to the Irish mammy, going to have a cup of tea. Go on, go on, have a cup of tea. And they do this very well and very nice. And it's and that's what they do. And they don't change in branding. And all their whiskey is really affordable, which is, you know, it's even even in Ireland where you know it's a little bit more expensive. The whiskey's affordable and they're great drinking whiskeys, you know. As I've said, I've had a, a, a fair dip into this this week just trying it because it's a phenomenal whiskey so i'm interested to see what your thoughts on it is and did anyone put water into it you know it's 60 percent did anyone put some water in and feel it did anyone put ice into it did anyone put coca-cola into it so chris is saying it's pudding stone fruit oaky spicy there's a lot going on isn't there there's, there's a lot peter put coke in <laughs> Um, it's a beautiful dram. It's a great balance of bourbon and sherry maturation there. Um, like McAllen gets all the plaudits in, in Speyside for um, the sherry maturation. Um, so another the stories in Speyside, on the border of Speyside Highland, at Glendronach, they were amazing at sherry finishing as well, and sherry maturation. But for me, Glen Farquhar are, are equally as good as all these big names. Of maturation, sherry maturation, and I, I and they're, they're great people to deal with. You know, I said it's family owned. I, I but before we opened the shop, um, I emailed them and said, "Look, I want to get the Scotch whiskey brand that I can import into Ireland direct from a distillery, so I can offer the, the consumer a good price." And within a couple of hours, the owner of the distillery gets back and says, "Yeah, Michael, no problem." Blah blah blah. We, we talked to a few people in Ireland, it's not happened, but if you want to take it on, you can take it on as the brand. Uh, you only have to buy so many cases and this is the price and that's that. And they were just really, really nice. Anyway, if you email someone, the bigger distilleries, you know, well, I'll have to put you onto our sales department, he'll have to put you onto our marketing department, he'll have to talk, put you onto our bullshit department, and then we'll tell you, no, you can't actually have it. You know? Um, and it's like, if you ever want to email a distillery just to ask for information, just send them an email. I bet you get a reply. I guarantee you'll get a reply that's not one of these generic straight replies. Someone will get back to you in such a nice way and you'll be hooked in. And then you'll go there to Scotland, you'll go and visit the place and you'll just be blown away by it. It's a, it's a very, it's not a much an assuming distillery. I have a picture, I'll show a, a, a screen of it. Uh, Well, you know, they've got this nice visitor center over here and they've got their, their fake little pagoda tower, which, so, you know, that used to be the, the, the top of the Malton Barrens. But if you look at the buildings, they're, they're not much to look at, really, you know. And they've got a nice copper pot still in the yard. I don't know why the stories do that. I can't understand why they're never robbed because copper is is worth a fortune. Uh, but you can see that if you look at around... This is probably about 15 miles from the town of Aberlour. There's not a lot going on. It's quite high up. It's quite, there's nothing going on. Like it's just, you can, you can, you can look ahead for a long time and <laughs> see nothing really. That's the, that's the distillery. Nothing, no, it's not impressive and picturesque to look at in some distilleries in Scotland, but one thing is, is the liquid, I think, is, uh, is top quality. Uh, Michael, I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is the photograph. I'm trying to show you this of the. Uh, can I do that? I guess I can't. But I have a photograph. It was in 1972. There we are. It's 72. So that was uh, that's older than me. <laughs> you can see yeah. that there. Can you? Yeah. yeah, it was in 1972. Yeah. And um, so what was that? 46 year old. At the time, yeah, at the bottom. <laughs> you don't get them every day. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get them back over. I don't think they'll be bringing out any 72s again with them. But, um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's a I still haven't had any more, but yeah, I, I might have another. I might fill this glass up again with this this evening. So, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Chinese whiskies. Um, 
there's a few different ones. I hope for some brands that you've maybe never seen before or tried before, and hopefully some brands you may try again. Um, if you've never had Glen Farkas before, I'm, I think I may have got a few of you hooked on it. Hopefully, you might try some more. It's a phenomenal whiskey. Um, we never actually uh, bought the pallet for, of whiskey from them, um, but we deal with a, a supplier in Belfast who supplies us um, with their whiskey from Glen Farkas. So they always have a, a steady supply of it, which is great. Um, and you know, I'm I'm going to spam you now and put and plug my the the whiskey festival. You know, the tickets are on sale. The the, the website is distilled.irish. That'll take you there. And it's it's a very simple website. Uh, it tells you what to do. Read about. You know, you have to you essentially buy three products to, to get your master classes in there. Um, some stunning whiskies in there. And we've got some scotches in there as well. Uh, there's an exclusive single cast just for the festival from Highland Park. Anyone who knows me knows I love my Highland Park. And uh, two years of begging for a, a single cast has come to fruition. And that that will be launched on the festival. And only people who have a ticket will have an opportunity, one, to try it, because everybody will get a sample of it. And um, two, the opportunity to buy a bottle. You know, if there's a thousand attendees at the festival, there's only going to be 300 bottles. So you'll have a fair chance of getting if you enjoy it. If you don't, at least you tried it anyway. Um, so if, if that's something to look forward to in July. Um, as a, a nice, there's lots going on. We've got loads of people involved. You know, the Red Breast Method of Madness, Rowan Cope, Talisker, Bowmore, I said Highland Park. The new Curl Whiskey, which is matured in seaweed casks. Um, Velvet Cap, that we just launched last week. Uh, Dahi from W.D. O'Connell is with his Bill Phil Peated Whiskey, Connemara. You know, it's all on the website. But, um, before you buy a ticket, if you are looking to buy a ticket, just read the section about. And it just tells you how to, to buy your ticket and make sure you're in, um, in, the, in the right country for buying a ticket because it is available internationally. So thanks very much. If you, if you want to unmute yourself and ask any questions, I'm here for the next good while anyway. So fire away. Thank you. Thanks a million, Michael.